carry the water for this thing to come. And some of my babies have so many secret messages that come with the phone and the phone So it's it's a miracle that uh, that you and your mother know that it's the number eight, that it's June the second, you know her name is Gloria, um, Elizabeth the first. These people are very trusting people, the Irish people who took the Bible. So all of us did have this and there was a time when we were even holding gifts. And in this we didn't get any free seats except for the Catholics and the Sons, the Chieftains. They were out in the storms and the same last time. So it was common knowledge that the husband was out watching him carefully when the heart was being burned in the morning prayer. So that's why we have so many of these altars taken on us today. Well, we have this little fellow. Meantime, we have this single mom happening. There's also something else that's going on in the countryside, and that's that. It's a kind of a relief. And this big relief is, uh, is starting to make me just wish that I'm sober as I said I'm a couple of minutes. And it's called smallpox. Now, smallpox is an infestation. Oh, let me back up a bit. Joe was a good person as well. And he was shown this. And his father, John, was kind of a little asking for someone in the next church to be either a founder or something to do with the Latin book. And he'd been employed by this family in Los Angeles. And Joe was working and he was very strong and he had all his faculties and he very well. And the family offered himself and he goes to another county. He goes to a family called the Missouri Brothers. Jim Ross becomes a king. But before he could find the uh, Missouri Ross, there's a lady by the name of Mary Fitzgerald, Missouri Ross. Does that sound a long name, right? Eh? Yeah, it's not the last name she will have. So Mary, or Missouri Ross, as I will her future will refer to her as, she sees this lad of the age of 14, 15, 16, he's a pretty smart man. And obviously he's able to uh, to permeate the household with the comings and goings. But I'm not sure exactly what his father did at this time, and I never knew. He was either working with the local iron works or working with the fire. But this turtle was a little smart man. And in that day age of this king, he comes in contact with something that, that uh, has no distinction, and it's called smallpox. So at the age of 18, Throughout Europe, we find that there are a lot of people affected by smallpox, which was a, uh, a, a, a disease that uh, made them delirious, high temperature, diarrhea, pus or sores began to surface on the body, and especially on the extremities. And oftentimes, the scars, skin scars, and there were scars in the cornea, and there were little turtle tearings as well at this time. So at the age of 18, before he's 18, he didn't even see it. They were still part of the family and at 16, he becomes blind. That's the way he was a blind and seeing light. Well, at that time, there are seven kingdoms, so seven kings of royal families that also were shocked at this plague called smallpox and this disease. For example, it was the whole family, king and queen, and so on, and their sons. Emperor Ferdinand of Austria died. Emperor of Japan died. Queen Mary II of England died. Uh, Tsar Peter of Russia, Tsar Peter II of Russia died. So uh, the citizens were interested in that and spread the ailment. And 400,000 people died of smallpox each year. And one third of the smallpox victims, one third of them become blind. So, so at the age of 18, Mary, these turtles are blind, thought an easy job, let me stick something, got to get in the back, you can't sit around and be, and sit on the hill, hills nearby, and uh, warm the face into the sun. Mary says to the turtles, you got to do something. So I'm going to show you a picture, and it's the only, luckily, uh, video that is, this part that I'll show you is the series where I belong to Carolyn. Thank you. 
Well, before Jerome and the news, in the age of uh, 14, and remember the National Head Start with Smallpox, uh, let me on board some of you when you're in your 14, 15, 16, uh, like to tell you what the training is. And one of the particular training we liked was a girl by the name of Gersh Cruz. And uh, he was so enamored with her that, um, well, the city almost fell in love and fell in love with men who were after But it was a little like a boy and a girl thing, and some of the last uh, pretty girls that they knew liked to be around before the last was set. But unfortunately, Gucci Cruz liked to know what And Cheryl did the primary school. And back then, you just don't mix the two together. So it never came to be. And she was from a family called Cruz, from the Cruz family. And Carolyn's family were still laborers, so never a match to be possible. But because he was in love with her, for special reasons, I have to love this place. Even though he went on to live a very successful life, and he was a very famous one, he never took up pitch. And he loved to treat people in her honor. Now, in Arthur uh, O'Neill, my research came from uh, Dennis uh, and Donald O'Donnell, and then I was from Arthur O'Neill, who also was a philosopher. And uh, a lot of the information I, I looked at was from this man by the name of Arthur. And in Arthur's memoir, he mentions that after the third ball, so he mentions what the bell sounds like, which is very well, they call it the ball. And it goes and sees this cruise fellow, this cruise nephew, a cruise fellow, who would happen to be a nephew of Gertrude Cruz. But in the story of Charles O'Connor, there's an interesting story about Charles romantic attachment to his lady. So when many years have gone by, oh yes, he gets married, Charles Denny gets married. He marries at the age of 50. I thought that's kind of funny that he was the young Denny, but the young kid, Gertrude Cruz. And he kept writing songs about him. What girl would leave a guy or want to marry a guy when he's single with this other woman? So he married this uh, Mary McGuire at the age of 50, married to a 20 ish. Uh, they had six, seven children by then. But anyway, back to Gertrude Cruz. So he's, he's in love with her and he's kind of wrote a true song about her. And uh, when he gets towards the end of his life, he's thrilled. And we decided to record with Charles O'Connor. There's an interesting story about Carolyn. He went on so much to things perhaps just purgatory. I'm not sure what, where it is. There seems to be a cave of some shape up there. And it's on a long dirt and a road. And the county of Donegal. Donegal? Donegal, thank you. And on his return to shore, he found several farms. He noticed there's several pilgrims going on shore to see their because it's happening at the four thousand boats. And he goes to these several pilgrims, they enter the water of the boat, and insisting the travelers into the boat, he chance by chance, he beholds a pond in the east hand. The east hand is on this gang of Bridget Cruz, and the sense of feeling does not dismiss him. Carolyn Cruz the following uh, piece of uh, poetry and music. And here it is translated in English. Now, of course, Charles O'Connor, he's off here, he's just trying to carry him home. He says, Honey, you know, if you're tired of listening to Carolyn's talk, you have to go visit Bridget Lane. But he said, I often listen to Carolyn sing in those and Miss Cruz in raptures, and I thought the stanzas were wildly enthusiastic and fantastic. Deserving. So that's how much Charles O'Connor saw of this, and he loved it so much so that it doesn't seem to be a problem.
And my research comes on John Sullivan in 1958, book on life and time and movement and material terms. There are a few pieces, and if you search on the web, some people will still find it distracting. I am not there, I was shy, and I have no idea when I see this text, I am just hoping it's, 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 it's written in English correctly. So I checked it, if, if it was the lady in our block community, we wouldn't have it, because it's a, if it's a, if it's a lie from me, it's a lie to me. So, in other words, what I'm saying is, if, if it's not correct, well, I received it incorrectly. Somebody else is wrong. Back to the English. Now, Carolyn has been the subject of uh, much fictional writing, which passes for history. And according to Charles O'Connor, Carolyn had advanced in her years of life before even attempting the English. So I was just this thing about. And, you know, it's not a very good spell to be in France. And they did not like to be corrected. Now, as far as uh, it's Sullivan in the life of times of Carolyn, there's only one song that he ever wrote in English. And the piece that he wrote in English is called uh, Carolyn's Devotion. And the subject, oh, oh yes, we are not sorry, it's not Joe. I know it's not really near, really, near how it's fifty, but I was in love with every woman. Do not love all those recruits, but every woman that he came across and seemed to want to, to hold them, you know, don't cuddle them in their hands because that was his way of identifying who's who. But he always wrote songs about women. And one of the songs he wrote was to Miss Sussex, Sussex Point, who did not understand Irish. A few of his Irish poems, maybe he just needed an English phrase or an English uh, title or a couple of pieces. For example, the song of which it goes is only one portion in the whole piece that's in English, and it says, I am not there. Or maybe a whole line, there's one whole line in English in the George Bass song. Now, there's a, oh yes, and the mock epitaph for poor Charles McCabe, he wrote entirely in English, oh yes, and uh, we'll, get back. we'll get to that later. But there was a man by the name of O'Dowd, or Dodie, D-O-O-D-Y, I'm not saying that right. Once criticized his English, and was asked why attempt the language which she did not know her English at all. Now, I think this well, I do know a little bit of it. Okay, says uh, Dodie, what, so what is the English for the word wazoon, which means hostility? I think the proper English for Bazoon is Billy Doty, and the chap is always known as Bazoon Doty. <laughs> now, this, the only piece he's written in English, of course, is to the lady, and he's on his way trotting to church. And of course, it happens to be the LFC. When I see C, we know here is my field. It's the holy lady is on the way to church or in the area. And of course, this is his line is so totally devoted uh, in his faith that on a fair Sunday morning, devoted to being attended to a sermon of the word of God, and such words on the Lord God to come. And through that, there's no notion of the function of she. Come fair and little garden that lots of us every year have been said. Come garden to love me with thee. I wish you would love and that I were with thee. I come this time in the woods, night so high. I hope fair maybe in the fair full of green. Through that is my notion, my devotion to she. And so we know where the line is. Now, and you knew a little bit of uh, the brochure that I passed out early at the beginning of the program. A punk who was drinking. This lad likes to drink. I didn't realize how much he likes whiskey. Uh, everything, oh, but my research, and in the 18th century, you know, a man could not be a composer uh, in, in a song that he made a lot of music. Apparently in Ireland in the 18th century, that's impossible. It would be a cardinal mistake to say that Churro Carolyn was a sock. That he was not. He could have composed uh, 
But he could not make people of such a number of sons and with such quality and such talent and such stimulus. And then at two years, almost to his uh, allotted span of life, I think, we think that his fondness for drink was due to his celebrated success. I think it's bad in the story. I think he was actually the dictator. But, oh yes, the latest one there uh, was this drinking. Well, story about a fellow Harper called McCabe. Now, if you look at his back, and McCabe, uh, Turbo has his back, and on it it says, Here lies in his back, McCabe, who is next. I'll tell you a little bit about the story of Charles McCabe. Charles and Turbo are in this pub, I guess on the way to a next noble place, and they like to meet together, and as you can hear, most of them, of course, a little bit of news. McKay, like Turbo, or so far, McKay, like Turbo, a quick way and satirical. McKay, like Turbo, has a short temper. McKay, like Turbo, he likes to drink. So one day, this is part of the afternoon. I think it's really, really in the afternoon. They're sitting just in front of each other, and they're sending all the yarns and stories and his wares and who they brought to where, to whom. And McKay says, Turbo, let's have a rest. How does a fellow, uh, we see who can drink the longest, gets to pay the bill? So they spent the money. So they keep drinking, telling the story. Remember, okay? Quite a sight. Turbo, drunk. So Turbo and Mr. McKay are sitting there and drinking too long. What is March Ale, by the way? Can anyone tell me what March Ale is? It's referred to in uh, Donald Sullivan's book, and Arthur, um, I can't recall. Well, anyway. So, I think we're having a little too soon. So, it was Mark Jail, and he was the book. Definitely Mark Jail. I was curious if I didn't know what the case would be like. But, as a matter of fact, at the end of the day, Turtle's chatting on, and this and very much, and it's a little quiet. I would assume all the people are going home, and they're the only two kind of left in this pub. Turtle says to his guy, what do you say? Sleeping, sir. Yeah. Okay. So there's a third party in this pub. They get the facts. And they put in the cave. Now, the cave must be pretty sound asleep. They put him in his bed. And they tie a rope to his neck. The cave stays up for them. In the morning, he wakes up. And he's just furious. He's so mad at Turlo. But Carolyn said, uh uh, remember the bet. That was the only way I could prove who lasts the longest. And on the little table, the fact that here lies in his back, in a cage to his neck. Well, that ended up with a little bit of a party match in poetry or prose. And they were at each other's knees. He was all sweet and just so quick. He had no sense of humor when it came to pranks upon himself. But Turlo was just as happy as speech. And they banter back and forth, as you know, uh, in, in some of the books in, the, in reference with McCabe and Turlo. That, ah, oh, McCabe was smarter than his poets before. Wasn't Turlo a little thinner? <laughs> now we go on to Francis. This is something a revolution I wasn't aware of until I got his way to study. Carolyn takes us to Francis. First of all, I'll uh, just play a little piece of Francis Lee. Um, it's called a piece that I really enjoy, and it's a very simple tune. It's uh, Francis. Does anyone know what Francis is? Praise. Praise, yeah, yeah. They're very playful, they're full of ornamentation, and most of the time they do not have words associated with Francis. They usually just show the instrument. A Francis is a very animated character. And it's not, uh, as you saw from this one, published in Scotland and in Ireland, such as O'Kane and O'Connor, can you say that right? Made two in order for Coke, entirely by the moment, for example, if you like Portland, Port Gordon, or New Hampton, or the Port Neal's tune, by the way. So there's no record of music used in the lyrics or the tune Francis before Carolyn's time. So the definition of Carolyn's Francis is a very 
that was the last of the young Belfast faculty. When I took the notice, it was just read at the age of 19 in the ordinance by the name of Edward Bundy. And he comes trying to his own invitation of the place to record his music. The music that will soon be lost. And Edward Bundy spends the whole rest of his time not only that he's totally inspired and travels all over Ireland because his history of copying is so great. Out of the ten in that seventeen ninety two, there are ten artists. Nine of them are blind. They sit down for three days to a heart music, and Edward Bundy is busy screaming them. And they ask one of them by the name of Dennis Hansen, and who how old are you? He says, Nine seven. Edward asks, uh, Edward Bundy asks, can I record what you have? Can I write it down? Ah, he says. No, he said, it breaks my heart. He's the only lad at the whole festival in 1792 to play this crooked thing on a wire heart. Now, Anne and Andrews is so kind to bring her wire heart tonight. I'd just like to uh, get the feel of the sound of what a heart is meant to us. Let's say this is gut. That person is the lamp. Thank you. 
food security. So those people were very important because that was his protection. And in wartime, you don't touch it up in wartime. You don't touch that way in the point that you seem to be immune on both points. And it was uh, pretty painful. They just did not, but they had so much respect for her man. I thought we need a 480 rule. And I was long, and it plagued you. I had an etch on a hurricane land, but I'll read it to you because I find it so interesting. And it says, the harvest is the only musician of noble standing. Flute players, tumblers, and timpanists, as well as jugglers, conjurers, and questions, who stand on the backs of horses back there, have no status of their own in their community, only that of the noble chieftain to whom they are attached. And this is from the Book of Irish Law, written in sort of 780. So it was just the untouchables. <laughs> I've never heard back in 1982, I think she came to the Confederation Center. I had tears when he got on my face. Yeah. What a beautiful voice. And what a beautiful heart. Do you know what she's done recently? Packed up her heart and everything and went with her husband to Africa. That was what she did. Yeah. So that's what we have heard from her recently. She's in Africa. She has married. She's married again. Do you remember there was a tragedy where she, you know, her husband and she, 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 yes, and she was in the comments? Yeah. yeah. So beautiful. Life. I get tears when I'm here. Yeah, you know, I met her, and she, and she said, just me my name. And I said, well, I'm not sure if you can say it. And she said,
and its roots in, in Scottish and, and Irish traditional music. So that's not what we'll be talking about next, next week. Uh, so note that. But any other questions for Jill tonight? Uh, are you all done? Lines <laughs> <laughs> down. In the first good one. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Jill, thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne, for, for bringing her and loving you. Uh, we have lunch at the back of the hall. We're in no hurry. I always uh, stress uh, stick around as long as you want. Uh, talk to Jill. We'll continue around for a while. Have a bite to eat, mix and mingle, and uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you all again next week. Thanks for coming. <laughs>